-hmm. So, anyways, um, the basic premise is that a lot of the problems that we see in civilization right now are just the ultimate manifestations of trajectories that were set in place thousands of years ago by um, douchebags who invented things like uh, empires and namely Christianity, the most successful of the uh, imperial uh, systems of belief and organization of civilization. And so um, I think a lot of people, I think it's mostly due to political correctness that nobody wants to diss Christians because they make up the majority of America or whatever, and yet they complain about being canceled and that their free, the, Christian, the, the free speech of Christians is the thing that we need to worry about uh, being uh, infringed upon, whereas the whole entire point of Christianity is to shut down uh, thinking beyond it. It's like they're... they're hello. <laughs> The, the whole point of uh, dualistic authoritarian religions is to narrow our imagination about what's possible. And so we accept the conditions of servitude that they uh, uh, give to us because we, they just neuter our imagination so we can't even conceptualize a different way of living and being and organizing civilization. And so, um, if humans decide we can't afford to keep Gaia alive, then Gaia will decide that she can't afford to keep us alive, right? Um, and so, a big part of, I, I, in my opinion, the, uh, the, the thing about this culture that is coming back to life is a our relationship with the natural world. Like, nature is literally the only reason we are able to exist, we're it. And um, so, and I think that, I've, I meant for there to be a, a bigger ramp up to this, but I'll just get to the main meat of it because that's what I really want to talk about. Big right? <laughs> okay, <laughs> that like, that Christianity and capitalism are like that. I, I, in my opinion, and uh, studious assessment after met uh, meticulously analyzing this shit all the fuck it for the past decade is that like capitalism is just is just the uh, next stage of Christianity basically. Like that, the marketplace replaced Yahweh as the the giver of all the good things. You know, and so it's like, <clears throat> so the the uh, conception of the Trinity, the the Christian Trinity of uh, the Father and the Son and a ghost. There's no woman involved in the creation at all. No female entity necessary in the Christian metaphysic cosmogenesis for the existence of the world. <laughs> and so, uh, as uh, as the written word um, came to displace oral uh, traditions of passing down knowledge. So, yeah, that's what I wanted to talk about is that, like, in oral tradition, like, storytellers could just, could constantly update the stories to the, what's happening in the civilization at the moment. And so, like, the keepers of the knowledge and the wisdom could like aid the society in continually evolving because they could just ad adapt it and make it and they're also tripping balls and then re you know uh reimagining how to tell the story better and what these characters you know and then when the written word came about then systems of uh mythology got co codified into these it's like like the for example one of the the like the Iliad and the Odyssey, like the uh, actually, well, to me, that's a bad example. So, Homer uh, lived at around 800 BC, 
and he's credited with writing a lot of the most ancient, what we know about ancient Greek mythology. But those myths existed for literally probably at least a thousand years before that. So the written version that we have, that we modern people can have access to, is literally just the version of it that after it had evolved from getting told over and over and over and over and over and over and over again for a thousand or multiple thousands of years. And so that's why these systems of pagan mythology are so complex because it's just like evolved over so many generations to get to the point where, you know, uh, you know, like for example, in the Hindu pantheon, there's like, uh, I shouldn't say, I, but there's like an incredible amount of deities in some of these pantheons from various religious systems, pagan religious systems. And so all of that nuance and fun, <laughs> frankly, um, was like when the written word came about, it was like it kind of, it, it enabled empires to uh, centralize because then an, a king could be like, this is the fucking law, I'm laying this shit down. And then he could like send his soldiers out hundreds of thousands of miles or whatever to go implement this. That's why the Roman Empire was unprecedented because the, the written word enabled the building of this empire that couldn't have existed before writing. And so that's why like uh, Siddhartha and Jesus and Socrates, like all the most important people at the beginning of the, the wisest sages that the that we, everybody, like none of them wrote a single word, like, um, well, I didn't write a single word, but at least not a whole book. <laughs> but like, and Socrates uh, was like aggressively against uh, the written word. Like Plato has a uh, dialogue called the Phaedrus, the P-H-A-E-D-R-U-S. And, and it's where he's talk where Socrates is um, talking to um, an Egyptian god, I forget whom, um, about the invention of the written word and how, and this, and, uh, oh no, no, the, and yeah, the, the, this deity is like, um, we've, we've solved the, it, it, the inadequacies of the human memory. We're going to be able to write, we're going to teach them this writing and then they're going to be able to write stuff down and then they don't need to, you know, that'll help, that'll help them remember it. And uh, Socrates is like, no, actually, writing is going to destroy human beings' memories. And, uh, and so, and he was, he was like, uh, it, writing will be a tool of, uh, of, rec of recalling things, but not of actually memorizing things. And, uh, and so he says, so, so much teaching will be done uh, with without much learning or something like that there's like so and he like predicted literally like the failure of our education system uh, two and a half millennia later right now <laughs> and so <clears throat> so and so he said that Socrates says in this platonic dialogue with Phaedrus um, which seems like a, I, I uh, Socrates is my biggest hero so I've read a lot of Plato's shit and it seems like this is probably a, to the extent that we can be sure that Socrates was a real dude, which I'm pretty sure we can, uh, that, uh, and this is, that this is something that I believed like about that philosophy had to be face-to-face -face communication. And that's when like, that, like the written word could not capture it all. Um, and so anyways, um, oh yeah, wait, I had a good, oh, I had a, some of the transition for that, actually. <laughs> um, that <clears throat> um, it just so happens that um, the uh, that the place where a lot of the knowledge of the ancient world, a lot of the earliest writings that existed when humanity when humanity first got the written word, were collected in the library of Alexandria, and then. Uh, motherfucking uh, Roman emperor burnt that shit down. And so basically erased what 
you know, memory we might have had about a lot of ancient civilization, like, which was all already mostly lost to history because it all existed before the written word even existed. But even the earliest stages of the written word would just all go incinerated by a tyrant uh, before Christianity came into being. So that's why I always like, it's like a nuanced conversation and, and Christians always are like, oh, you know, you're just like, you know, hate Christianity or whatever. And it's like, no, 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 it's, like, it's a more nuanced analysis of like, how civilizational structures came into being. Like, I, I uh, went to a Jesuit high school, so I had like very, I have a very intimate knowledge and in relationship with this uh, Christian dogma and shit. Um, and so, and that's why I became a philosopher because uh, it was also uh, convincingly shoved down my throat, but uh, that I happened to have access to psychedelics as a teenager and so that and which is the thing that Christianity criminalized in uh so the details of that um there's some water actually I meant to keep the water by me so I wouldn't have to ask but <laughs> please yeah do you think if we had like continued the tradition of oral storytelling like maybe some of those old myths from like the ancient world would still be yeah Definitely. Like if we had, if we hadn't like written it all down and put it in a library, that right, 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 right. That would still be alive. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And, and because it's this, it was the same people who, um, you know, we're trying to codify everything that also went around the world and slaughtered all the shamans and shamanesses in every civilization, every pagan civilization on every corner of the world. Yeah. Like so, the, uh, I, have, I have a good friend, brilliant. Um, uh, decolonial scholar, metanostic meta uh, scholar, he calls himself, that he's, he calls it the forced Christianization of the globe. Where it's like they, these tyrants just literally went around the world and they're like, and then the Christians talk about they're getting canceled. And they're, they're like real aggrieved by like cancel culture. Like it's the, oh man, oh, we got to really feel bad for these Christians, you know? Uh, like after they literally spent the last 2000 years going to every place on the planet that they could find, just to murder the shamans and shamanesses with all the pagan knowledge about nature and uh, ancient systems of mythology. Because it's the only way you could pitch a, like, as uh, mythologically and spiritually impoverished system of metaphysics as Christian dogma. <laughs> it's just like so simplistic, it's like white bread. You know, there's, there's, there's like not, there's not much to it. That's why a lot of churches, so the Puritans, the, 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 the flavor of Christianity that founded America and did the genocide of the Native Americans were Puritans. And the Puritans are against all sacred art. So they don't put any, they, they think that it's idolatrous for the Roman Catholic Church to even have stained glass windows. So Puritan churches, plain white walls, no art. And it's like, how demented of a fucking spiritual tradition. I can't even imagine what it's like to go to church. They, people go to those churches and then they keep going back every week. They put their 20 bucks in the fucking thing. And it, so I, and I actually I hadn't even planned on talking about the Eucharist, but that's a big part of the bait and switch where, because the Eucharist in Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth's early cult was definitely psychedelic. And that's how it, that's why the Roman Empire couldn't crush it and had to order his assassination on the cross. Because if he was just giving out bread and wine with just alcohol or whatever, and be like, yeah, this is my, my flesh and my blood, eat this shit and drink this shit. I'm like, I'm pretty sure that those followers, when the fucking Roman Empire was just like, hey, you better renounce that shit or we're gonna fucking cut your head off. And I'm sure, pretty sure they'd be like, yeah, never mind. If it was just bread and wine. <laughs> like, yeah, no, I'm not that dedicated to this actually. <laughs> but they couldn't crush it and had to crucify this motherfucker because he was a shaman. And, and so, I, and then ironically, <laughs> A few hundred years later, uh, 
they're like, yeah, let's actually, and for Constantine, is like, yeah, no, actually, uh, let's make this the, like, or no, he was the, he wasn't, he didn't make it the official state religion of the Roman Empire, but he was the first Christian, uh, Roman Emperor, Roman Emperor. So he legitimized Christianity, and he convened the Council of Nicaea, which codified the uh, the New Testament of the Bible. So all the because there was lots of Gospels going around about this character Jesus, and also lots of other gurus that called themselves the Christ. There was like there was like um, uh, Josiah the Christ, and there was like various other people who called themselves because the Messiah was just, a, you know, a prophet, a, 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 mess, a mess, I mean, a savior figure prophesied in the Old Testament. So it was, so anybody, so and it's funny because I was caricature this, because I'm, I'm a, you know, uh, you can tell I pro, that I see myself in him and that I just, I, and a lot of those people that, because like, you know, one of my idols is Russell Brand. He, he after the, one of this whole, that whole, thing where he like went on that media tour and like talking about I don't trust politicians and media in this country and, like it blew up his Hollywood career or whatever right after that he went on a international stand-up comedy tour and called it uh, Messiah complex and so so then he went, went on another round of fucking MSNBC interview or whatever they're like do you have a Messiah complex <laughs> Russell's like what the fuck kind of question is that I just caught, titled my whole thing about that and just blew up my whole multi-million dollar acting career to, uh, to try to save the world in this like whatever so I just think that a lot of people in that time because around Jesus time like Rome had I mean like I was saying the, the, the author, authoritarianism is not good so it, it, it just feeds corruption and so there was lots of people like Jesus that were like this is all gonna fall this is the this all shit is fucked up and so when Constantine convened the Council of Nicaea they that's where Christian dogma all comes from is that they were trying to narrow that down they didn't want they didn't want the narrative out there that like oh there were that it's ideas and uh, mystical experiences that are animating the um, dedication to this cult that you know some uh, some called themselves Christians but some didn't but they were like the irony though that it was that that same empire who literally crucified this motherfucker that then was like yeah actually he, no he's the only guy <laughs> and we're, we're gonna go around the world and chop everybody's head off who says anything else <laughs> and <laughs> and so they went and they they did it everywhere that's that's how the native american genocide on this continent happened it was like it was both it was the, the perfect conglomeration of the profit motive and this christian you know uh conception of and it's and it's almost it's actually um maybe maybe more accurate to call it an abrahamic conception of god that is like uh that when he you know did the ten commandments he was like he was like number one i'm the only fucking one you're gonna worship now <laughs> like because and the reason that, that was number one on the ten commandments was because at that time yahweh was just one insignificant god among a whole plethora of gods that were various people believed in and venerated in the region and so I, I just picture him like another character. I'm like picture him like meditating on the mountaintop with his fucking burning bush or whatever, which has been uh, fairly uh, well established with an acacia tree, which has DMT in it. And so the revel, the burning, yeah, like so it's like been. And academia is still ridden with, or riddled with, fucking Christians as much as. The Christians try to say, no, academia is like this satanic organization that's like out to get us. It's like, well, to the extent that that is the case, I mean, it's, uh, uh, it's uh, not only overwhelmingly valid, but it's against a, 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 a tide of multiple thousands of years of it being like the reason freedom of speech even they even wrote that into the constitution was because of how uh unfree 
uh, speech had been for the previous known history. Which, uh, so history is just the written record. So everything that happened before writing, the written word that I was talking about, that's not history, that's prehistory. And so every, all of history, the, his story, like it's the, the patriarchal, authoritarian empire age. So it's like, as soon as they can write some shit down, <laughs> like in my book, I'm like, I'm like, um, I'm like, uh, human beings invented writing, and uh, and then and then all what you, all of a sudden we get a god who uh, makes himself known in prophecy and makes contracts through the sacred text, and then uh, <laughs> I was like, and it's like, sorry, wait, no, I fucked up my own joke. Uh, it's like, and the, uh, human beings invent contracts, and all of a sudden we get a banker god who, you know, it's like, is measuring, you know, like how many prayers you did or whatever, like, and, and, and like, and it's just so everything about, everything about Christianity, just like, they're like begging us to call their bluff. They're like begging us to be like, hey, hold on. But then they just were able to say, hey, don't talk some shit. Top your fucking head off. And that's part of how it worked. That's part of how it, that's part of how the, they could know that you're in the cult because the faith, because the like faith is so uh, illogical that you have to just, it's a sign that you're, a, it's like a, it's a virtue signal to the community that, ah, uh, yeah, I, I'm not going to ask too many questions. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just accept that God can both be a, the father and the son and the ghost oh God, and there's ghost. I got into a thing. I was like, what is the ghost? <laughs> like, no, Everyone's like, God is a ghost. I'm like, what do you mean? Like, Why is that, that doesn't make any sense. It's like it's for God in the form of a ghost. <laughs> Sorry, dude. No, I, I, totally. This this hat came up recently and Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I still don't know what the ghost really is. <laughs> It's the. It doesn't make sense. Well, the ghost is. It's the Holy Spirit. It's like the, the thing that you can't see. Isn't that what God is? Right. Yeah. Exactly. So it's like. Yeah. Exactly. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well put. <laughs> Just trust us. It exists. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why I expected this to make sense after. Yeah. Right. Less sense now that I the fact that you looked into it is a sign that you're flirting with Satan. No, I had people at the bar, they were like, go look it up, God is a ghost. He's a ghost, go look it up. Doubt is a sin. That's my two cents. Hell yeah, no. I like what you're doing. Thank you. So, and so, like, for example, one of the big, um, the, the pagan religions I happen to know the most about because of being a philosopher is the ancient Greek religion because that's where philosophy, you know, philosophy as we know it in at Western academia it all comes from ancient Greece and so I uh, so I sold psychedelics in college and I was in I was in the middle of taking a Greek Greek myth class it was like one of the most popular classes at our school it was the giant auditorium 800 seat auditorium like it was packed every semester uh ucsb nice. yeah nice tell yeah <laughs> it's an awesome school uh -huh. and uh so it was i i was literally learning about greek myth while getting prosecuted for distributing the exact things that people in ancient greece were inventing this fucking religion by using and so, and, but and I, I like, so I was like, like every source of authority in my life was telling me, no, this thing, your, your, for all intents and purposes, religion, I wouldn't have identified it as that yet at that time. But I now, knowing what I know about religion, can say that that's what it was at that time. And my, my parents and my university and my government and my uh, uh, former church or whatever, like, because I had to get like letters of character reference. And so I, like one of the people I thought I'd get a good reference from was the, the, the teacher of the social justice class that I took uh, junior year of high school. Like, because I was like, 
her favorite student in that class, cause, and, and like, because I, I could tell that she could tell that I actually understood what the fuck Jesus was talking about, like about social justice and all that shit. And so I was like, she's gonna write me the best letter of character reference. And like, I don't get to, see, I didn't get to see, see it before the whole court shit, like, you know, completed or whatever. And she was just like, yeah, he was a good kid, but I could, I could see him getting into drugs or whatever. And I was just like, this woman wrote to the court. That she thought that I was a good kid, but she could see me getting mixed up with drugs or whatever. I was her favorite student in the social justice class. That's so dirty. Yeah, dude. <laughs> I like asked for her a letter of character reference. So I and and like. Well, I did, but you're supposed. Right. 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 So anyways, yeah, so I had to do some, yeah. Anyways, like, but, so, but when you, like, read Greek myth, like, it's just so obvious that they were tripping. And then when you, like, learn about, so there's this book called, uh, it's called, um, uh, called, uh, uh, Solving the Mystery, wait, no, damn it. I think it's called the Sacred Road to Elusis. So, oh, damn it! Wait, fuck. No, it's a. Damn it! I'm really mad at myself for not remembering the fucking title of this book. But it's it's a short book. It's like it's like 70 pages long, and it's like between uh, it's a uh, collaborative work. It's a series of papers that were presented to, to uh, the American Philosophical Society, I believe, um, or at least. So, Gordon Wasson um, was uh, the one who, uh, he was like, a, an, I mean, he was a banker, but, so that's why he was able to, like, just be exploring South America and Central America, or whatever. So he discovered the, like, what he called the uh, uh, Mexican sacred mushroom cult. And so, in 1952, and he presented it to the American Philosophical Society in 1952 where he said, where he proposed that uh, or, or after the, his, his talk on this cult that he had discovered in Mexico or whatever, that he, 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 says, he says in the book that he suggested that this might lead us to the solution of the Ellicinian Mysteries. So the Ellicinian Mysteries were like the main temple, like, uh, so Eleusis, the temple at Eleusis was in ancient Greece, it was kind of like a pilgrimage. It was the main pilgrimage site that they would have like, so they have the greater mystery in the fall and the lesser mystery in the spring. And so people would make pilgrimage, pilgrimages all of, from all over the Greek speaking world to Eleusis to experience this mystery. So where the term mystic comes from because it was the title given to the people who went through the, the lesser, the, the first uh, of the mysteries, which, and so, and in the, in the historical record, they talk about how um, they would drink a potion called the Kykion, the K-Y-K-E-O-N. And so there was like, there's this like been this big debate amongst classical scholars for the entire, you know, since the Renaissance to mid 20th century when this book, when this, what, about what the nature of the Kykion was. Like, what, it, what was this potion that the ancient Greeks were giving out at this temple at Eleusis that people would like make these foot pilgrimages from thousands of miles away to go experience this thing. And that they would all say was the most important experience of their lives. And it's, and the, the, uh, the, uh, the mythology around the Eleusinian mysteries was about uh, venerating Demeter and the her. I won't do the whole version of the story with uh, um, her. It's like, I'm like, see, because that's a good example of what I was saying earlier. That these myths are so complex that it's like hard to reduce them down to. Like, there's this part of me that wants to just be like, okay, here's one or two sentences, but it's like, but that. Anyways, it's it's the a myth that explains the seasons and why everything dies in the 
uh, fall and then to be reborn again. And it's to explain that like Hades um, made basically a deal that he could get Persephone, the daughter of Demeter, the grain goddess, basically uh, analogous to Gaia basically, her, actually my, I don't, I've, I haven't been able to answer what, I've tried to figure out how analogous the, 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 the two are, but, um, but that, so the initiation rite at the temple of Eleusis was like, they would, in my, uh, reading of this book, this, uh, you know, solving the mystery was that they would go, that the initiates the, who, who earned the term mystes, like M M Y S T E S, would would experience that uh, phenomenon, the cycle of rebirth, death and rebirth, that the earth goes through every year as everything dies and then is reborn again, and so it's like they the ancient Greeks described the mystery of Eleusis as um, a way to conquer the grave because they didn't, you know, um, fear death afterwards. And so and that's where Christianity is like, it was like, actually, we need people to fear death. That's kind of our bread and butter around here. So they went to Eleusis, which had been uh, offering this rite for a couple thousand years, like, at least that we that are established and known. Like I said, whatever happened before that, literally lost the history because there was no history yet because nobody had written anything down yet because they didn't have words yet or written words yet. But Christianity came along and just like, yeah, nope, shutting all this down. <laughs> um, and uh, so uh, in 390, uh, well, first, so it's, this guy, this Emperor Theodosius, he, he was like one of the worst people in human history. He, he shut down the Olympics in, uh, in, uh, in 392 um, because, or 393, because it was a pagan festival, you know, a Greek pagan festival. That, um, and then and I feel like, I just feel like he was just like, he probably just like, it felt so good. I'm like, I could shut down the Olympics. What, what, what else do I shut down next? You know, what, are, what other pagan shit can I fucking crush? And then he ordered his army to uh, crush the Ellicinian Mysteries. And so they, they literally ransacked the temple, destroyed the shit. And uh, uh, later, I don't know, I can't remember if this happened immediately or later, but uh, they, they built a Christian monastery out of the ruins of the Ellicinian temple. So there's literally blocks in this monast in this Christian monastery in Eleusis that are like sideways broken pieces of fucking cement <laughs> and rock that were like carved in part of the Ellicinian mystery temple. And so that as uh, one of the co-authors of this book, the, uh, he's a, he's a uh, classicist scholar with, you know, he's, his main thing is studying ancient Greece. Um, he said, to, uh, to, I love the phrase, that he said, uh, to obliterate the memory of the pagan traveler. So like, they just like, it, they, they had nothing else to do. There was like, there was just not much else going on back then. And so a lot of these guys, hello with them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, a lot of these like uh, tyrants that were just like, well, yeah, let's just go shut down all the competition because everybody else is telling more interesting stories. And so the only way to uh, conquer the world uh, was to just uh, get rid of all those storytellers who were telling other stories. And so that's what they did. And then uh, the, at, the, at that same exact time, the Roman Empire started collapsing. So over the course of the following century, from the late 300s to the late 400s, the entire Western Roman Empire just collapsed because it was, they were so focused on just like trying to, I don't know, I just feel like it's, it's, it's like a perfect test case of like, uh, like how authoritarianism just like fucking crushes whatever it like seeks to control. Like I have this like phrase in my thing. There's this great war, war uh, movie called Sandcastle or uh, 
uh, end. And I was like, I was like, uh, it's the perfect image for empires because uh, kings in their lust for power grasp at the world, uh, but it always slips from between their fingers because they crushed it and destroyed it. And so that's kind of what happened to Western civilization around that time. And that's where, that's wh why it uh, went into what is called the Dark Ages because uh, they fucking just murdered everybody who was involved in evolving civilization. And they were just like, yeah, no, we're in charge now. And then uh, they didn't contribute anything to <laughs> civilization for the following fucking millennia until Fibonacci um, in, 12, in 1202 uh, published his book, uh, Book of Calculation. I didn't, there's not a lot of uh, literacy going on in uh, the 13th century, but uh, Fibonacci uh, popularized the uh, uh, Hindu uh, numeral system, which had the zero, uh, which the Arabs had been using since the 9th century. So that's part of why so much more progress in science and all the uh, aspects of civilization happened in the Muslim world during that, in, in, because they, they, they got the zero. They got the Hindu numeral system like four centuries before uh, Rome did and so uh, they were able to develop commerce and mercantilism and, and, and the structures of uh, exchange that evolved into capitalism eventually but like uh, as like an, or, an organic um, transition uh, <laughs> so amazing <laughs> dude <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I don't think I, I don't think I got to pet him actually. <laughs> How am I doing on time actually? I should oh I should have brought that clock over here. Huh? Okay. All right, I'll try to try to condense all of uh, the history of civilization into an hour. <laughs> um, but so, and I, damn, I'm, I'm like, I'm like impressed with myself for not even really referencing my fucking notes, which I was worried were going to be too much writing on each of these cards for to be, for it to be a practical reference to. Um, but it's like studying for a test, you know, you're like the the act of making the study guide. It drills it in. <laughs> right. Thank you. <laughs> right. <laughs> totally. <laughs> what? Is that my phone talking? What? Was that my phone begging to be turned off of airplane mode? <laughs> But, uh, so <clears throat> around that same time, um, that's when, let's see, okay, I forgot how much, all right, I'm trying to figure out how much, <laughs> um, so around that same time, uh, it was when the Magna Carta uh, was, so there was a group of rebel barons who were like, didn't like the, actually, I feel like this is, uh, not, knowing how much time I have left, I'm, I might actually skip that part. Um, but anyways, that was a kind of like a way to lead into the uh, significance of the printing press, which uh, doesn't need any more PR for me because uh, it's the most lauded uh, invention in the history of civilization. Uh, and uh, a lot of people take, uh, uh, claim the mantle to, uh, of the uh, the of the printing press. Uh, like I once saw a uh, Coke Industries ad on YouTube uh, that was like that was like talking about how revolutionary the Gutenberg was in creating the printing press, and I was like, uh, I just was just I was just like in awe. I'm like, oh, so you want to get rid of the regulations that are like you know cutting into your fucking like plastic uh billions or whatever like 
by citing like the revolutionary you know, capacity of, I don't know, anyways. But it makes sense in the context of the fact that uh, the printing press uh, put the, all of the aspects, the characteristic features of civilization that were established with the invention of the written word it like put the, all those on steroids because then you could like pr print a million copies of uh, you could, uh, of a book and so that's that's the only time when literacy started to spread beyond the ruling class because it was like hey we got all, we could print all these bibles cheap and so uh, people were printing bibles and and the uh, Johann Proust who's like Gutenberg's like uh, business partner there's this, there's a story of like he shows up in a town with a barrel full, uh, with a wheelbarrow full of uh, printed Bibles. And, uh, and he's accused of working with Satan because the townspeople are like, wait, you couldn't have, how'd you make all those Bibles? <laughs> and in retrospect, there's some, there, was some, there was something to that because the, all those printed Bible, all, all those cheap Bibles made it possible for peasants to start reading scripture and learn how to read and Along with that, that um, so came the Protestant Reformation. So I was in 1517, and that was like a, a generation later. And all of a sudden, the the hegemony of the of Christianity was split in half. So they started going to war with themselves after they they had been like, so they had um, been at war with the Muslims for hundreds of years in the Crusades, uh, and so. They're, they had already lost a lot of their like uh, military might because a lot of people were dying in those fucking wars and or being like, I don't want any fucking part of this. It's how, I, I always wonder like how many defectors there were back then because it's like, I don't, I, I mean, not that we're not, I mean, I feel like the US military is like not less ruthless towards their goons who go AWOL than the fucking Christian military was back then <laughs> for thousands of years. But I, something tells me that there was, uh, it was, might have been a little bit more uh, brutal with the torture and shit before there was any semblance of a constitutional protections of, for anybody or whatever. But anyway, so, so the, like this, this authoritarian mode of organi organizing civilization kind of like evolved into this it evolved, it gave way, it, it, it was um, vulnerable to uh, f uh, basically um, the people who were able to use commerce most effectively and use their property to gain more property and then they overthrew the church and so that's part of wh where we get a lot of our modern institutions was in, in the 18th century where they were just like they were like yeah we can just make it up now now because like we can you know like they're like they're like hey thanks church for uh you know giving us a pass on uh you know uh turning this continent into a fucking blank slate or whatever <laughs> like in their eyes like i i i imagine that they're just like yeah actually we're gonna set up a new thing and uh and I just imagine that, that these capital, the early capitalists, they were just like, they're like, all right, we like that we got this whole structure of civilization to ourselves now. Now that the priests lost their credibility because they were telling us that the earth was the center of the fucking universe for thousands of years and said you and chopping people's heads off for talking shit. And then they're like, but all of the structures of authoritarianism that the church built were still in place. They, they were not the aristocracy was not dismantled it was just uh given a new ju justification rather than purely based on a hereditary claim to uh whatever that it was just like oh you they have somebody has money therefore they are worth more therefore god has determined that they're worth more and so that's why they get to be your fucking in charge of you and tell you what to do and that's what I, and i think that's where we have been at for a couple, you know, that lasted for a couple of centuries. And then as the scientific revolution led to the industrial revolutions that like transformed civilization in the 1800s, like that, which Nietzsche 
came along at the end of the 1800s and, and proclaimed the death of God, like he, he was observing that God had died. He, he, I was just listened to a podcast the, the other day that was like, that was like talking about that, about how like, and, I, and I've thought about this, I heard this and thought about that before, that Nietzsche didn't kill God. Nietzsche, it wasn't that Nietzsche was so, such a great philosopher that he like outlaw, he like, you know, refuted God or whatever. He, he was just, that death of God phrase is what he was observing what had happened to civilization that we had all this technology now and people didn't, you know, that we, like people were feeling like they didn't need a God. And so like right as this, and so, and he said that there, there was going to be like a, a power vacuum there, which I mean, clearly there was and because in the 20th century, like that's where fascism comes from is feeling that like trying to trying to put a uh trying to rebuild the spiritual side of that authoritarianism without relinquishing the, author the authoritarian part of it and so but at the along this same timeline the late 1800s uh and 19 and and early 1900s was kind of when um, the pagan revival started happening. People started being interested in what, what, what had, what, what was it that the church occulted over the past thousand years while they were going around, uh, you know, uh, uh, eliminating, uh, other, you know, interpretations of reality, whatever. Like, so it's funny because, uh, it's, there, there was a, a Pope named, um, Pope Pius the ninth who, he, he's the one who officially codified the dogma of papal infallibility. Are you familiar with this? Uh, the, which is the Catholic dogma that the Pope is infallible when defining doctrines to be upheld and, uh, by the entire uh, apostolic community, which is what they refer to the Catholic Church as. So it, this was like 19, or in, in like, eight, in like in the 1850. Oh, no, no, it was the 1870s, I believe. Um, but it was like the same decade that the uh, Theosophical Society was founded. So it was like, right at that same time, it was like, you could, I, and I'm, as I'm learning about all this, I'm like, I'm like imagining these like, these like people at the Vatican, they were just like, like, hi, we got to put a lid on this. Like, we got to, okay, hey, issue a proclamation. We're infallible over here. <laughs> like, and right, cause, because, and the reason they had to do that was because people were getting interested in the occult and tried, just wondering, like, what were these other, you know, systems of interpreting reality that existed before? Uh, and so, and then that kind of was like evolving. And then, like I said, in the, that brought up about the Alexander Mysteries part of the story is that like, so Albert Hoffman, you know, accidentally discovered, creates an, or, and then accidentally discovers LSD, 1943. And so he's like, has this international reputation for being the guy who fucking invented that shit. And you know, cause Sandoz Research Laboratories had sent that around to every psycho psychiatrist in, you know, most of the world to like be like, hey, this is a really interesting new fucking thing I just invented. Like, what can we use it for? And so like, it was, but before all the authoritarian governments in the world were like, actually, hold on, <laughs> we need to not have you widely distributing that so much, actually. <laughs> but, uh, Ram, Ram Dass said that acid coming to the Western world was, like, was God being introduced to the Western world. <laughs> <laughs> totally. <laughs> uh huh. Exactly. And and so that facilitated the like um, the um, the people who had been kind of uh, rediscovering the ancient pagan ways. Like all of a sudden, like people just rediscovered psychedelics like, on a mass scale, and they're like, okay, wait, yeah, no, this whole this whole Christian capitalist paradigm that they told us was the only game in town. There's no other way to do civilization. Uh, everything else is, you know, savagery or whatever. Like, and so that's why a lot of people like went to India because like they're the, they still have their polytheistic pagan religion somehow. And it, maybe it's just sufficiently patriarchal that they, 
that, that, that it was able to sustain itself throughout the, you know, these couple, this these couple millennia of the written word dominating, you know, empire, whatever. But, anyways, like, the, so I see a lot of what this culture raving, and so like, so I kind of see. Um, so I, I, I conceptualize raving as like one of the three pillars of the like futuristic DIY new paradigm of culture. So I kind of think of it as like punk and raving and hip hop as like the three uh, aspects of this um, that all emerged in the 70s at the exact same time, right after the capitalists and, and the Christians. Uh, 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 launched a war on us. <laughs> they were like, yeah, we're going to have to fucking... Uh... <laughs> so, uh, th so that's part of why there was all those, I mean, all, the ass all those assassinations, both uh, literal assassinations and character assassinations in the 60s, because they were, had to be like, okay, we got a lot of utopian thinkers out here that are really influencing the society to like inter reinterpret what the fuck is possible for this shit. And uh, we want to tell them that, uh, no, the only other option is uh, Stalinism or whatever. <laughs> and so I just think that that's, I think that's a big part of why it, so much of it has gone into the cultural realm um, in the past half century, which, you know, obviously I'm, you know, I am here and I'm passionate about doing these types of and experience being a part of these types of events because I see them as uh, the revival of our relationship with reality and the natural world and mythology and our imaginations and each other that like it's a revival of like what was what what was good about civilization before all this all the fucking authoritarian shit that has happened in the past few thousand years uh, since writing was, has, has structured the civilization. And I, it's ironic because I wrote a fucking like 800 page manifesto about a lot of this shit. And I'm like in the f final stages of like editing that and whatever. So I'm a big lover of the written word. So that's, that's if I have this like interesting relationship with it. Words are my, my passion. I fucking, I, uh, whenever I hear a word I don't know, I'm like, what the fuck is that? Like I just heard a word the other day, hylozoism. It's the belief that, uh, the philosophical point of view that all matter is alive. Wow. Hylozoism. H-Y-L-O-Z-O-I-S-M. I learned that in a lecture that I was watching this week to prepare for this talk of a, uh, of a professor at Loyola Marymount University, which is a Jesuit college in LA. Uh, a lecture uh, called Understanding Neo-Paganism. And so he was like talking about a lot this shit from their perspective, from the Jesuit uh, theocracy's perspective of like, what are we, uh, what, what are we dealing with here? But whatever, <laughs> he's like, uh, and, uh, he, and he, he used that word like, in, 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 in conjunction with like animism and pantheism and just like and panpsychism and just like a, a, a belief that a lot of that is common across pagan or neo-pagan systems of belief that the world is alive and sacred and God and so he was like he was like I was like yeah the uh, the, the neo-pagans are really into uh, venerating the, the the creation rather than the creator, as 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 uh, as we were warned about in Romans one or whatever, I know that good and I'm like, wait, so I don't know. It's just the I, the, the, the level at which they understand our argument. They're still yeah, like fuck you. Actually, we're gonna still tell people to worship this invisible fucking thing that exists outside of and purportedly uh, in a causal relationship with, but unprovably reality rather than worshiping actual reality they're like and it's evil in fact to worship actual reality and or and have 
you know, interesting ideas about it outside of what we fucking say is it, you know, like, and so I think that's a big part of, uh, hello, hello. <laughs> um, one of the things that he said is like, he's like, uh, another common f- feature of neo-paganism is that it's anti-dogmatic and anti-authoritarian. And he like said that in the, with like a negative tone. It's anti-dogmatic and anti-authoritarian. I, I, I'm like watching this like, yeah, like, but yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm fucking saying. Like, it's like, I'm like, I'm like, what are you, I'm like, wait, you, did, I, I had to, I had to go back and I was like, did I just hear that right? Did he, did he really just say that? Like, like he's. That's part of his critique of neo-paganism is that we're anti-dogmatic and anti-authoritarian. Like, and he was like, he's like, and that's why you won't find any, uh, you won't find any pagan creeds or uh, pagan uh, prof- religious professionals because <laughs> they they don't have codified roles the way that the church does. And so this is like a Loyola Marymount professor like explaining this to presumably students at, in, in his class, like at fucking a Jesuit college, which costs like a fucking hundred thousand dollars. About like, it's like, yeah, man, these damn pagans, they're, they're, you know, they're anti-authoritarian. Like, that's why we gotta really worry about them. And uh, he's like, he's like, oh yeah, no, that's the thing. He's like, cause you, everybody can just, they all just make it up as they go along, and and that's part of part of why they that's that's part of why they celebrate tolerance and diversity because you know nobody's better than anybody else and people could just everybody has you know equal claims to the truth because they they emphasize the mystical experience so their knowledge of god comes from inside rather than from a scripture that we said god said was the legit version yeah dude (laughs) that's like literally like one of the top universities in the country this is what they're teaching (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and I just, I, and so I, uh, I just happened to, I don't know, I feel like I happened to have a, the, an interesting intersection of expertises and experience, life experiences that have like enabled me to understand what the fuck game they're running here and how long they've been running it and how, uh, um, Demonstrably, on, hopefully, on its last legs it is, because, is that a, okay, <laughs> um, oh, we're looking at the time, okay, um, I guess, damn, I meant to wrap it up around now and go to Q&A, actually, like corruption is deeply rooted is what you're saying, right, right, yeah. totally, and, but, like, the, that, that, this, that, I, Another part that I didn't get into, along with the rise and popularization of psychedelics in the past half century, is the internet and digital technology, because it has kind of, it's recalibrating the imbalances towards linear, authoritarian, command and control modes of thinking that the written word and books structure civilization and our cognition around for the past few thousand years. And so all this, the hyperlinks on the internet and how, how visually centered it is, like, like it's more about picture, like we're, we're, text is still a big part of it, but it's like the early stages of, like these shifts are happening over like centuries or whatever. So it's like it's, any of our lifespans can't really, you know, notice it happening or whatever. But it's like, that's the big picture is that like, uh, that's part of why I, Sight, punk and raving and hip hop as like the nexus of this next level because it's like this um it's just like an unleashing of creativity uh that has that was enabled by uh technology and uh uh psychedelics one of the technologies um, uh, among the technological uh uh ascension that we are in the uh, midst of. Uh, so, anyways. Psychedelics are a technology, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Do you think that, like, part of the reason where, like, our planet is struggling so much is because, like, I feel like, like, when we were pagan and we were, like, worshipping the earth and, like, actually we wanted to, like, take care of it. Right. 
go to heaven. Like, we're going to focus on what goes on after death and, like, not on earth at all. Right. Like, up there. It's like we stop caring. Exactly.